News of the Times, Murderous Mondays, William Dove and the Wizard. Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, it is 1856 in Leeds. Harriet Dove has died over a six-day period in the most excruciating of agonies. Strychnine, a relatively new drug, is suspected given the types of symptoms exhibited by Harriet as well as the knowledge that her husband, William Dove, is in possession of the poison. All of this sounds depressingly familiar, except that Dove has, supposedly, sold his soul to the devil, and has been in regular contact with a wizard, who allegedly has been pushing William to kill his own wife, so that he can get a better one, as predicted by the wizard's fortune-telling. William Dove, The Wizard, and The Murder is today's episode of Murderous Mondays. We very much hope you enjoy the show. We start this episode with some background of the characters in this murderous story. About Harriet Dove Nee Jenkins. Harriet Dove married to William Dove is 28 years of age, Press reports describe her as a faithful and incredibly patient wife to William in their troubled marriage. The papers did not describe her as attractive, and indeed, these are comments from William describing her as unattractive, and his wish to do away with her and start again. The couple have no children and employ one servant. About William Dove. William Dove was born in July 1827 to a middle-class family allowing William the benefits of a good education. It was said in the papers that the parents were indulgent with William and that he was favoured in the family. After completing formal education, his parents decided to set him up as a farmer. William was allowed to do his grand tour of the States and upon his return he was apprenticed to two different farmers before finally being set up in his own farm as a tenant. It was during his second farmer apprenticeship when he came into contact with Harriet Jenkins, also from a respectable middle-class family. The two wed and set up home on the farm which he leased. There is no evidence regarding their relationship for the first two years together, but we do have testimony from their servant girl, Elizabeth Fisher, testifying to the difficulties within the marriage once she was employed with them. From the Leeds Times, the 15th of March, 1856, the Doves removed to Cardigan Place from a farm at Woodhouse near Normanton in November last. They only kept one servant, a girl named Elizabeth Fisher. For some years it would appear that Mr. Dove had been a man of irregular habits. He was frequently intoxicated, and whilst in that deplorable state, had been in the habit of grossly abusing his wife. He, however, promised that if his wife would come and reside with him in Leeds, he would reform his habits. There was grounds for a few weeks for supposing that he intended to keep his promise, but when a month had expired, he became as dissipated in his conduct as before. His wife, having expostulated with him on the subject, he appears to have retaliated, not in merely in a coarse manner, but in a highly vindictive manner. We do not trust ourselves in this place to repeat the startling evidence which was given in reference to the domestic deferences of the pair. It will be found at length in the deposition of Elizabeth Fisher, and it would be unfair to the prisoner to comment upon it until its truth had been carefully illuminated. That they were frequent quarrels between Mr. and Mrs. Dove, that in the course of these quarrels strong language was used and revengeful threats uttered 
by the prisoner against his wife, we fear will be found to be too true. Setting the scene Before we look at the crime in question, we must take a look at the shadowy figure of Henry Harrison. According to William Dove, Henry Harrison is the clear antagonist in this story. We know that Henry Harrison was born into a family of dyers, residing in Ball Lane in Leeds. Harrison, a rather dissolute young man, lost his job and drifted into theft. He moved into a lodging house owned by Elizabeth Brown, with whom he started an affair. Through Elizabeth's son George's grocer's shop, Harrison used the opportunity to begin trade as a wizard, selling herbs, charms, and magic spells. Eventually, in 1850, he was marketing himself as an astrological doctor and dentist, and offering charms, incantations, and spells. Certainly, his services, such as they were, were used repeatedly by William Dove. From the Leeds Times, the 16th of August, 1856, Dove, Wizards, Capital Punishment. There have been dying speeches and confessions more replete than Dove's with melodramatic horror, but a stranger story than his never passed human lips. He does not, as did Burke, disclose a wholesale traffic in blood but he lays bare a condition of ignorance and degraded credulity, uttering abhorrent to the boasted enlightenment of the age. The belief in wise men or wizards is not extinct, nor are the dupes of that creed to be found only amongst the boors and drabs who are either entirely uneducated or just sufficiently literate to spell through the complete dreamer. Not only does the farmer's labourer think he can cheat his landlord's bailiff by the imposition of the wise man's spell, but the farmer himself, a student of scientific farming and, a, and professing member of the Methodist connection, is, if we may believe his dying statement, led on to cruelty and murder by the influence of the enchanter of the South Market. According to his own account, which be true or false, but which is equally astonishing as a display of degraded credulity in the one case, or of daring mendacity in the other, Dove's connection with Harrison dates back to September 1854. He was then keeping a farm at Normanton, and deploring the loss of a dog stolen from him. He consults John Hardcastle, a farm labourer, who tells him of Harrison, a wise man that can discover thieves, backing his recommendation by relating an instance of his powers. When bailiffs were coming to take Hardcastle's goods, Harrison caused the horse they were driving to take fright and their chase to be overturned. Another time, when some guns had been stolen, Harrison compelled the thief to pass by a certain place and shoot a rabbit, and he was taken. These tales producing a profound impression, Dove applies to the magician to put a spell upon his landlord's agent to induce him to renew the lease. Harrison comes to the farm to bewitch it. Five pieces of bad halfpence adorned with cabalistic scratches are solemnly buried in different spots about the house and farm. Harrison then leans his head on his arm and his arm on a gatepost and prays aloud to the seven wise men of whom himself is one, invoking their power to save Dove from harm. The incantation completed, 
the wise man gives Dove a piece of paper covered with hieroglyphics, which he is to take along with him when he visits the agent. Dove goes with the talisman in his pocket, but King the steward is obdurate. The failure, however, is easily accounted for. King is an Irishman and would take a great deal of working upon. Dove is quite satisfied with the explanation. For though he lost his farm, his faith in the wizard remains unimpaired. In the meantime, Dove and Harrison have talked of Mrs. Dove. Her sickly looks, her constant ailments, her interference in her husband's acts, as in the order to revoke the gift of a stick to Harrison, all are discussed, and for all a panacea is provided in the shape of certain herbs. The lady, however, declines the beverage. Again Dove complains they are unhappy together. No wonder, says Harrison, for she is always vilifying and backbiting you to her friends, and she is two-faced. The domestic unhappiness continuing, Dove's faith in Harrison would have waned, but for a circumstance that occurred to strengthen it. About the back end of October 1854, Dove's father was rapidly sinking. Harrison predicts he would die before the 25th of December, and accordingly he died on the 24th. Hence arises a strong belief in Harrison's supernatural power. Yet the promised spell fails to effect a change in Mrs. Dove's demeanour, and then the wizard says the original mistake lay in Dove's having married her. A bright sketch is drawn of Dove's future happiness with a second wife, in whom are combined the attractions of auburn hair and fortune. The present unhappiness will soon be all right, for the encumbrance will be removed before March, or before the end of February. As it is, there will be no peace till she is out of the way. It is then insinuated that there are drugs which cannot be found in the body after death, belladonna particularly in a crystallised state, defying detection. The conversations and other circumstances gradually lead Dove up to the strychnine. It would seem that Harrison has predicted that Dove would get a new, better-looking wife with auburn hair and with money. The problem, of course, is that Dove is already married to Harriet. As Dove is trying to figure out how to make himself available to the auburn, moneyed woman in the neighbourhood who seems to fit the profile of Harrison's prediction, the question arises as to what to do with Harriet, the current wife. From the Leeds Times, the 15th of March, 1856, a lady poisoned by strychnine at Leeds, startling disclosures at the adjourned inquest. Matters went on in this unpleasant way until about two months ago, when a conversation took place between Mr. Dove and a person called Harry Harrison in the New Cross Inn in Meadow Lane. In the course of the conversation, the case of William Palmer was discussed, and the properties of strychnine were also the subject of consideration. During this meeting, Mr. Dove asked Mr. Harrison if he could either make or get for him a bottle of strychnine. To this startling query, Mr. Harrison said he would not supply strychnine for the world. Mr. Dove then rejoined that it did not matter that he could obtain the substance from some other source, and here the conversation for the time ended. A short time afterwards, Mr. Dove does procure ten grains of strychnine from a young man named Elliston, 
assistant to Mr. Morley's the surgeon, to whom he said that he required the poison in order to kill some cats. The prisoner obtained about five grains of strychnine on a second occasion from the same party and for the same alleged purpose. A remarkable conversation on the effects of strychnine in the human body and the probabilities or possibilities of, is, of its detection took place at one of these interviews and will be found in the evidence of Mr. Elliston. A cat was after poisoned by the prisoner on the 25th of February. Mrs. Dove, who had previously been suffering from a nervous affliction, was on Sunday engaged by a killer spasmodic attack, which for the moment baffled the judgment of her doctor, Mr. Morley. There were considerable contractions of the muscles during the attack, and other particular symptoms marked in its continuance. The thought of strychnine crossed Mr. Morley's mind, but he dismissed it as too horrible. Mr. Morley prescribed antispasmodics and was surprised to find that the symptoms did not give way under such treatment. A second attack, similar to the first in appearance, but increased in intensity, occurring on Wednesday the 27th and a third attack on Thursday the 28th of February. Again, Mr. Morley's judgment suggested that strychnine alone was responsible for each particular symptom, but he could not calmly and reasonably consider the thought and dismissed it from his mind. Mrs. Dove continued to be subject to these attacks until Saturday the 1st of March, when she expired in great agony. The prisoner had been in the habit, according to the evidence, of administering the medicine to his wife, and on one occasion, when this process had been noticed by the witness, he was observed to mix something with the dose which had the effect of causing the portion to effervescence. He has also repeatedly expressed a belief that his wife would not recover. He has intimated to her that her position was totally dangerous, and when a medical consultation was proposed, he objected to the step on the score of expense. Dove is also averse with parties who were about him when asked about the necessity of holding a post-mortem examination. He has stated that his wife had a strong objection to being dissected and owned that he also was averse to such an operation. The Science Our regular subscribers will remember the famous case of William Palmer that we covered in one of our earliest Serial Killer Saturdays. The case took on great significance with Dove as during the Palmer case it was believed that strychnine could not be detected in the body after five days based on the testimony from a medical expert at the time. However, the doctors in Leeds were not to be baffled. They took the remains within Harriet's stomach and fed it to various small mammals all of whom died, and replicated the same rigidity and spasms that had been witnessed and testified of. The evidence was considered conclusive. Harriet had been killed by strychnine. The inquest confirmed that Harriet had indeed been poisoned and Dove was the primary suspect. Dove would go to trial at the next York Assizes. As investigations proceed into Dove's antecedents, strange stories begin to emerge. From the Leeds Times, the 15th of March, 1856, the prisoner is 28 years of age, but looks several years older. He now appears to be sensible of the awful position in which he is placed and during the proceedings on Wednesday at the inquest, 
he was visibly affected during the delivery of the evidence. As is usual in such cases, the public testified a highly morbid curiosity to see the accused, and the courthouse has been thronged during the inquiry by an excited audience of whom a considerable proportion were ladies. Since his apprehension, his demeanour has been markedly correct and appropriate to his serious position, and this is a man whose recent life has been marked by irregularity. There's a great deal of floating gossip in the town relative to the prisoners and his antecedents, much of which is, no doubt, exaggerated and only founded upon a very slight substratum of truth. Among these is a statement that the prisoner was guilty of startling eccentricities when a schoolboy that he once took a pistol to school to shoot a tutor who had offended him, and that he used to tell his fellow pupils that he had sold himself to the devil and was guaranteed an existence under certain prescribed conditions. When he was the occupant of a farm at Bramham, Dove on one occasion is said to have cut off all his cows' tails, and at another time he smeared over their bodies with phosphoric matter so that they might assume a lurid and unearthly appearance at night. As he awaits trial within prison, Dove, in a moment of despair in his cell, writes a letter to the devil in his own blood. Dear devil, if you will get me clear at the assizes and let me have the enjoyment of life, health, wealth, tobacco, beer, more food, and better my wishes granted, and live till I was sixty, come to me and tell me. I remain your faithful subject, William Dove. The Trial The evidence was all fairly damning. That Harriet had been poisoned was considered a fact that could be proven scientifically. That Dove had purchased strychnine twice in the lead-up to Harriet's death was also proven. The strychnine had been kept in his shaving kit, so it was not easily or accidentally available to other parties. Dove had been seen to feed food and drink to Harriet with an almost immediate reaction on her part. The symptoms of extreme rigidity, spasm and twitching were all standard expected reactions to strychnine poisoning. Strychnine as a poison was still clearly in the public mind with the infamous Dr. Palmer case of the year before. It was not now the unknown drug it had been a year ago. Dove's defence attempted first to persuade that Harriet had killed herself due to her own mental instability. This defence was quickly disproven. Dove next tried to plead his own insanity defence, but the jury found that he did know what he was doing in purchasing the strychnine testing the strychnine on animals and then giving several doses of strychnine to Harriet. Dove was found guilty. The Confession As Dove awaited his execution, and upon realising that the attempts to have his death sentence commuted had failed, Dove confessed. From the North Wales Chronicle and Advertiser, the 16th of August, 1856, Confession of the Prisoner. William Dove has made a long and most extraordinary confession to his solicitor, Mr. J. M. Barrett, which that gentleman reduced to writing, but objected to furnish it to the reporters until after the execution. This confession is as follows. 
I wish to repeat that the statement which I have previously made to you respecting Harrison is strictly true. Harrison has, during the time that I was at the farm at Bremham, and also when I lived at Normanton, and afterwards at Leeds, frequently told me that I should never be happy until my wife was dead. This was when I was pressing Harrison to put a spell upon her so that I might live happily with her. About the end of last year, or the beginning of this, I was in Harrison's warehouse, opposite his house, and he then told me that Belladonna could not be found in the human body after death, particularly if it was in crystallised state, and he then offered to make me some, but I did not request him to do so. At this interview he stated very positively that I should never be happy until she was out of the way. I had no desire at this time to get rid of my wife. My belief was that Harrison was possessed of some supernatural power and that he could, through some influence, compel her to live happily with me. He kept continually telling me that I should never be happy until she was out of the way. I asked him in the month of February if he could do anything to get her out of the way, and he said he would lay her on a sick bed and she would never get better. The first strychnine was got, as mentioned by me in my former statement, on the 10th of February last, and for the purpose of killing cats. The whole of the strychnine obtained on the 10th of February was used for the purpose of killing cats. The second quantity of strychnine was got by me, I believe, on the Thursday or Friday following. The first and second quantities of strychnine were kept in the razor case, which was placed on the mantelpiece in my bedroom. I had told Harriet when at Normanton that Harrison had predicted her death at the end of February. On the Saturday after Elizabeth Fisher left, I took the paper containing the strychnine out of the razor case and put it in my waistcoat pocket. I then went to my mother's house. In the afternoon, I had previously called at Morley's for my wife's medicine. It was an effervescing draught in two bottles. At my mother's that evening, I took the cork out of one of the bottles and touched the wet end of it with the strychnine. I then put the cork in that bottle again and shook up the draught. Before this, I ought to have stated that I had, during that Saturday afternoon, put a very small quantity of strychnine, perhaps half a quarter of a grain, in some jelly which my sister Jane brought from my mother's. My wife took a spoonful and made a remark about how bitter it was, and that she then requested Mrs. Fisher to take some. She did, and then remarked it was as bitter as aloes. I took a spoonful, but did not taste the bitterness. On that Saturday evening, my wife took some of the draught in Mrs. Witham's presence. Mrs. Witham tasted it and stated that it was bitter. The draught was not shaken that night before it was taken. My wife did not suffer from the effects of it at all. On the Sunday evening following, which was the 24th day of February, I went into Mr. Morley's surgery, and there, being no person in at the time, I took perhaps ten grains of strychnine and folded it in paper. When I got home, I placed it on the table. On the Monday morning, I gave my wife her draught, the effervescing mixture, at about half past nine, and at ten o'clock she had the attacks, as mentioned, by Mrs. Fisher and Mrs. Witham. At the time my wife took that draught, she complained very much of the bitterness and added that she would tell Morley about it. 
there were three or four doses left in the bottle. After that draught was taken, I broke the bottle in my wife's presence, fearing that Mr. Morley might taste it. The mixture was changed on the Monday. The mixture then given was very bitter. On the Thursday, I got another bottle of medicine from Mr. Morley's, and I again applied the wet end of the cork to the strychnine as before. About the same quantity of strychnine adhered to as on the former occasion. The last dose of that mixture was taken on Friday night at about 10 o'clock and my wife was taken seriously ill in half an hour. I was drinking at Sutcliffe's public house on that Saturday and I was more or less affected by liquor all the afternoon and evening. At about three o'clock in the afternoon I went into the stable and took about a grain and a half of strychnine out of the paper and put it in another paper which I placed in my waistcoat pocket. I put that strychnine into the wine glass which contained a little water I believe. It was the water which was left in the glass by Mrs Whitham after giving my wife the third dose in the afternoon but I have no recollection as to the time when I put the strychnine into the glass. I gave the mixture in the evidence in the presence of Mrs. Whittam and Mrs. Wood, as stated by them in their evidence. I poured the mixture into that wine glass which contained the water and strychnine. I did not put the strychnine into the wine glass in the presence of Mrs. Whittam and Mrs. Wood. On either of them, I know that I put the strychnine in before, but I cannot remember how long before giving the medicine. I did not, when I gave the medicine on the occasions mentioned, think of the consequences of giving it, but when I saw my wife suffering from the attack on the Saturday night, it flashed across my mind that I had given her the strychnine and that she would die from its effects. I continued to believe in Harrison's power for some time after I was committed to prison. I believed that he had the power to save me until June or July. I have only to add that the verdict of the jury was just and correct, and that I freely forgive every person who has been concerned against me, as I hope to be forgiven. William Dove Condemned Cell, York Castle, August the 7th, 1856. Signed in my presence, J. M. Barrett, 5.30 p.m. Dove was executed at York Castle before an estimated crowd between 10 and 15,000 people on August the 8th, 1856. And as for Harrison the named instigator of this plot. No action could be taken against him at the trial. However, he was kept in the sight of the police. Approximately 18 months later, Harrison was convicted for four years for bigamy. That concludes this episode of Murderous Mondays, William Dove and the Wizard. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy this show, we would be grateful if you could like or subscribe to our channel. We are passionate about historical crime and do our best to present interesting cases from long ago that go beyond the usual fare. For our listeners and subscribers, thank you. We so very much appreciate the many supporters and subscribers who have helped us to build this channel. The News of the Times team all appreciate each of you for your help. We upload four days a week. Saturdays are Serial Killer Saturdays, where we do an in-depth look at a serial killer from our extensive database. The time spans of these ranges from as early as the mid-16th century to the 21st century and encompasses men, women, children and couples who kill. Mondays are murderous where we investigate in-depth 
a historical murder. Wednesdays are wicked, where we pull together stories of a similar theme, such as stories of murders by starvation. And Fridays are frightful, with stories that are grouped by geographic location, allowing us to share lesser-known, grisly crime stories. From all of us at the News of the Times team, thank you again for watching or listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.